Hi everybody, it's Mama Kay coming back at you from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And I'm thrilled to have this next person uh, to be interviewed today. I have known them for going on 15 years now and we met in the best place ever to meet somebody new and that was at a summer band camp. And we have remained good friends over the years and they even took a chance on me and let me student teach with them. So without further ado, special guest, who are you? Hello, bonjour, I'm Chantal Marte. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Chantal, what is your job? Oh man, I'm a music educator here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I teach currently grade five and six uh, general music and grade seven and eight band and jazz band at Ecole Viscount Alexander. That's in Pemina Trail School Division uh, here in Winnipeg. So that's, uh, I'm on my third year uh, doing that. So that's my current job. And, now you uh, have another job that's also happening at the exact same time right now that's sort of taking you away from the classroom. And what is that? Yes, I suppose my most current job, uh, I'm uh, currently at home on maternity leave and uh, I have a daughter, her name is Pascal. And so I'll be here at home for some time with her. And that's a very good job as well. <laughs> you have the most beautiful family, Chantal. It's it's really wonderful to, to see to see your family grow. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So I wanted to say, well, I've been doing this for for some time as well. Uh, we've known each other almost 15 years, and I have been a music educator for 15 years. Can't believe that. Uh, since 2005. And so this is my third year at Viscount, but before that I spent a good 12 years at uh, Ecole Golden Gate Middle School. And that was a, is a middle school in St. James Assiniboia School Division. And it was my first job and a wonderful community and wonderful kids. And um, I spent, as I said, 12 years there, learned so much, uh, worked with great colleagues, uh, and that was grade six to eight. A band and jazz band again en français and in English because it was a French immersion school at that time and um, it was lovely and at that time I, I was uh, expecting our second daughter and so there was an opening closer to home and and there you go I interviewed and <laughs> got the job <laughs> at Viscount and I'm very happy uh, to be there as well. Very good. You and I were just chatting before um, about it's quite a different uh, setup in the school in regards to the amount of kids that you're teaching, right? I know Golden Gate and Viscount have um, it's it's quite a quite a shift for you, sort of um, in the amount of kids that you're seeing. Yes. So <clears throat> at um, Golden Gate, it was always over 500 kids, you know, 550. I think my second or third year there, we were pushing 600. That was <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Walking in the halls was an adventure, you know, I remember that. Um, and so that was, again, for three grades. But my current school is grade five to eight, so four grades, and we're just over 300. So even just that 200 less is is a really big change. You've, I feel I can get to know the students more, uh, you know, on a personal level. I see them all basically, and uh, and um, and the staff too. We had a bigger staff at Golden Gate, and that was awesome. I got to learn a lot about working with a big staff, and um, but having a smaller staff, you know, the jokes are 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 fun are more funny, <laughs> and uh, and it's really nice to be a little bit more tight. So I like that. They are so lucky to have you there. Chantel, I don't know much about this part of you at all and I can't wait to hear about it. What was your musical journey from baby Chantel up to when you went into university? Oh man, yeah, this, is, this was the part, Joanne, where I had to think about it. It's like, oh wow. So music has always been a part of my life uh, because it was part of my family's life. And here's how it happened. My parents love music. I wouldn't say they're the best musicians, but they love music. So there was always music happening in our house. Um, 50s and 60s, music is their favorite. You know, the oldies, it was always in the car, would be singing, doing that kind of stuff. 
my father ha was, you know, I would say a big music advocate. He had our whole basement because he would entertain in the basement. It was just this wall full of records and cassettes, right? <laughs> and, and we would listen to all kinds of stuff. So I said 50s and 60s, but he loved 40s big band jazz. Um, we had a bunch of French musicians, stuff from the 70s, the 80s, the Beatles, the Bee Gees. I mean, you name it, we probably had something and, uh, and it was going on. So I have a lot of good memories about that. My mother um, took piano lessons as a, as a young lady and she didn't really continue it, you know, as an adult, but always promoted that. And my father was self-taught, but later when, when I was a baby, he took uh, saxophone lessons and flute lessons. And so he played, started playing at church. And so, you know, I have early recollections of him <clears throat> performing there and, and also just practicing in the basement. And um, he would also play, he would work at CN, so he would play at their Christmas parties. So, you know, it was alive. And when I go to church, uh, my uncle also sang there. So it was a normal thing, like you sang or you heard music, it was great. Another thing you may not know, uh, my dad has a side job. He worked as a videographer and a photographer. So in those days, you know, you would need people to do this. And I remember couples coming to our house and they would go in the basement and they would listen to music for hours and hours just to pick the right songs to put as a little introduction or maybe an ending to their wedding pictures or to their wedding video that my father would do as this side job. So uh, that was really fun because then you get to hear what they like too. So sometimes they'd bring their stuff and my father would play and you know, they'd discuss some stuff like that. So that was really good. I think, yeah, it was very eclectic. I also remember, this is a neat tidbit. <laughs> My family would fall asleep to Gregorian chant. They'd fall asleep to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My father would put on this Gregorian chant on the, on the, <laughs> what, and, and all I remember is like falling asleep in my bed. And, go, <laughs> <laughs> and so this, so, I don't know if we were just weird or, or what, but like I told you, music was, was really everywhere. So that was awesome. Um, it was always very present. When I was five, so uh, I think this is a really important thing. When I was five, I had a major surgery and it affected uh, my dexterity and my, my overall feeling on my entire right-hand side. So I actually started piano lessons shortly after um, to develop as a form of physiotherapy, actually. So to develop strength and dexterity. And so that was nice. Um, you know, I also took ballet lessons at the same time. And again, it was just for more rehabilitation. But little did I know those experiences of moving to music and playing music and responding to music in those different uh, genres, like really helped help me understand and I guess appreciate what I loved about music as well. Maybe at the time I didn't, you know what I mean? Like you grow into it, but, but I knew that it was something I would always really enjoy. So that's, that's kind of neat. So I went to a Caltaché in the DSFM and my music teacher there was Madame Julie Monjean Ferré. She was a lovely lady. She currently works at Education Manitoba and she works um, in uh, I believe on the music side, like she helped develop the curriculum and all that, but on the French side, so dans le bureau de l'éducation française. So that's kind of cool. She has a, a cool job there. If she sees this, hello, madame. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a lovely lady. You know, we would sing and just do great things. And then in grade six, everybody had to take band. So I wanted to play the clarinet because I wanted to sound like Benny Goodman and in sing, 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 and like play all these solos and maybe play the clarinet polka too, because that was really cool. <laughs> um, my father called it the licorice stick. So I don't know where that came from, but I thought, okay, maybe I want to play that because that sounds kind of cool. But then, you know what? 
I tried it. So, you know, we had the trial night at my school and I tried it and I was no good. I, you know, and I know surprisingly it wasn't really what I thought, but what I forgot to tell you is my father played the alto saxophone and I had of course started fooling around with it. Well, meaning he, he said, Hey, do you want to try it? And I said, yeah, okay. So he gave me a read and he's like this is your read keep it safe so I said, okay so i was really happy about that so i actually brought the saxophone to the tryout and i said can i try it can i just let you you know can you hear me so i played whatever it was three notes and and they said well you sound pretty good so you can start on saxophone so i said oh wow you know so we could so that was really cool um i didn't have a great uh, band experience. We played one song <laughs> the whole year, and um, I, and I I can understand why. I think we had to we had band one time a cycle, and we had to walk to the other school, and it was at the end of the day. It was like it was not great, and everybody was a beginner, and you had what you know I don't know forty minutes an hour, so really maybe that's all we could muster. We played through a method book, and then. We had one song. So by the end of that, <laughs> that experience, I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. Um, after that, I went to Collège de Buriel, and that's a grade seven to 12 school. And I had heard about their music program and, and their band program. And I uh, met Monsieur Ferreris, and <laughs> yeah, he was pretty awesome. So then I said, okay, I think, you know, I'll, I'll continue with Ben, and boy, I'm glad I did. So. So Norm Ferraris, Monsieur Ferraris, Normand Ferraris was uh, my, my teacher from grade seven to 12, which was really nice, you know, to have that six year relationship. He get to learn a lot. And um, well, he exposed us to just so many things. Um, I think you, you might've gone in and done some work for him, am I right? I did a lot of clinics at Louis Riel. And okay. it was always, yeah, loved it, loved it, loved it. Yeah, like he would get people in all the time. He would get uh, Jean-Francois Fanet from the symphony, you know, the trumpet player. Come, yep. come work with my trumpet section. Okay. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was really cool and uh, a very good man. There wasn't any choir in my school uh, at Liberiel. It wasn't a really big program for that. Um, so it was more band and jazz band. And I got a lot of opportunities opportunities to solo. Uh, we played in a saxophone quartet. We had many trips. Uh, I remember because it was in St. Boniface, we would always perform at the Franco-Manitoban Cultural Center. Like that's where our concerts were. It wasn't that's a big amazing. deal. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal like to, to be on the stage because that was our stage. Like we go practice and, and we had that uh, access, which was really cool. And in CCFM, um, if you remember, it used to be a club, like a bar called Le Foyer. Yeah, I would go there because that's where Marty Jazz would happen, right? That's right. On, that's on right. Tuesdays, yeah. Marty Jazz was, was at Le Foyer. Now it's Estella's. But back then... And then there was like a pit. Yes! So we played in this squished pit. <laughs> <laughs> I sure remember that. I don't know how he fit us all, but the whole jazz band fit in the squish pit. I think we had to stand. That's, that's how we would fit. And, um, and we played there once a month, once a month. So we would learn like whatever it was, two, three songs, and then all the jazz bands from grade seven to 12, however it was, we would go there and we would play once a month. And it was okay because all our parents were there. <laughs> they were watching us. So there wasn't this big, big kerfuffle about having minors in there. And it, it was so authentic. Like when I think back to it, it's like, yeah, I was playing in, a, in, in some sort of little club. <laughs> and, and that was really cool. So I really appreciated that. Uh, there was a Quest Music started on Provencher Boulevard. I don't know if you remember this. This was years ago. And Sam, uh, the manager, what's his name? Sam Tr Triculus, I think. Anyway, I was on the corner of uh, Des, Des Murons and Provence, wasn't it? A little, little bit further. farther, closer to the library, actually. Oh, so okay. Closer to the bridge. 
And, um, and anyway, I remember the store opening and our jazz band played, you know, as it was opening. And so, you know, we got these little authentic experiences, which was, yes, very much same B. <laughs> yeah. but, but it was really cool to be able to do that. Chantal? Yeah. Did you ever take um, saxophone lessons in high school? I did, yeah. But I, only at the end. So, so I don't know if I said, oh yeah, earlier on I mentioned I had taken piano. So I continued that till, um, till about grade 11, 10 or 11. I knew I didn't want to be a piano player, you know, like I just, um, I really appreciated learning everything I did, but I didn't feel, uh, you know, passionate. I just, so I said, okay, I think I've come to, to a level that I'm happy with. Uh, I didn't continue ballet because I couldn't do the splits. So I was very upset. <laughs> so, so my, my, my ballet, um, after about five, six years, that, that quest ended. Um, but I did take lessons in grade 12. Monsieur Ferrer has connected me to a saxophone player from the Air Command Band at that time. And his name was Jean-Francois Lambert. And so he lived in St. James. <laughs> so I remember driving to his house and feeling like it was on the other side of the world. Like anything past Polo Park, if you're in St. Boniface, was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's a world past the airport. It's crazy. So um, I remember going there. And I was just amazed at how I could hear a classical saxophone sound for the first time, because up to that point, I'd only ever heard the band sound. Like I hadn't really uh, been exposed to, or a jazz band sound, but not really, um, not really a classical sound. So Jean-Francois told me for, for a year and man, had I wished that I would have taken lessons before. <laughs> The piano really helped though, Joanna, I have to say. The piano basis, just of being able to develop two hands and kind of understand how it works together, I can say that really helped me. Like, okay, well, let's play scales on saxophone. Let's play it, it, you know, with this articulation. It's like, oh, okay, I understand a little bit more how, how to do this. <clears throat> so he was my teacher and he helped me prepare the audition to get into university. So how did you know you even wanted to go into music though? What sort of, what gave you indication or who really sort of um, pushed you in that direction or motivated you to go down that road? Well, you know, in grade 11 and 12, they really, you know, everybody's, maybe everything starts thinking, okay, what do you want to do? What, 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 what path am I going to take? And I wanted to be a dentist because I well, love you. Have fantastic teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I know that's like really off topic, but it's like oh, you know, you get your smile. Well, thank you. I'm a product of braces. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I I did, and I think you know the part I loved about being a dentist, which is so, maybe the wrong thing, is I loved the people. Like I just liked that you. I know this sounds so weird, but that you could be close. Um, <laughs> physically, I guess. And, and we would just, I remember having these really nice chit chats with my dental hygienist and, and my dentist and I had positive experiences. So I was like, yeah, I want to go study teeth. So anyway, I digress in grade seven, uh, sorry, 11 and 12, they had, you know, these job symposiums, that kind of stuff. And maybe universities were set up. And I remember going to, one came to our school and then one was at the convention center. So I went there <clears throat> and I looked at programs in dentistry and it was full of pharmacy, pharmaceutical classes, science classes. And I was looking at this and I was looking at what a first year would entail in university. And I was thinking, man, where's the time for music? Like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna play in a band? Like, what am I gonna do? And I think that's when it clicked, you know, it went, oh, maybe. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be a dentist. So I heard another, a few other interviewees maybe have some of these moments. So that's what it was for me. I loved music, but I never considered it uh, a career, you know? I just never did. 
until that little realization. But again, with Mr. Ferraris, my piano teacher, everything kind of <clears throat> music in my family, it seems like a very natural path to, to want to continue. So anyway, that kind of prompted me and hence that's why I took the lessons. Right. So where did you, you so you auditioned? Where did you audition? Well, uh, it was a big choice between Brandon University and, and University of Manitoba. And in the end, I went to U of M. And the reasons why was I got scholarships, <laughs> which helped with the, with the money, right, with the payment. But also, I think it was closer to home. And I was just, at that time, uh, wanting to exercise that. So, I, so uh, I started at U of M in the year 2000. And I took the integrated program. It was the five years uh, Bachelor of Education, Bachelor of Music program at that time. And oh, it was crazy, it's wild, it's busy. <laughs> and I met so many good people there. Uh, another interview we had Brent, you know, Brent Johnson. Well, he was in my year too, so we were all starting there together. And, you know, I just have great, great memories of, of learning together, being very stressed out together. <laughs> uh, Who was your saxophone teacher there? Well, it changed, you know because there were shifts at that time. So my first teacher there was Ross Engstrip, a uh, very good uh, musician, very knowledgeable man. He was a sessional teacher, so he was hired as a sessional teacher. So after my first year, um, he left. And so then we were short. The whole saxophone studio didn't have a teacher. So for that second year, they hired people from the uh, community. So Ken Gold was called, Andy Clausen was called, Roger Manti was called until they found another prof or teacher. And, and so I studied with Roger Manti and he lived nearby the university and it was just so uh, great. I, I really enjoyed learning from Roger. He's a tremendous musician who worked hard. He knew how to teach if you didn't know how to have that skill. Do you know what I mean? And I learned so much from what he taught me if I didn't have that innate ability, right? He would say, okay, let's do these exercises. Let's get you going. And I really learned from that methodology because I wasn't, you know, we all have strengths and then we all have weaknesses. So he really helped me learn on those weaknesses, uh, work on those weaknesses, sorry. And then after that, uh, my third year, Alan Harrington was hired and he was hired as the saxophone teacher and also the bassoon instructor, I believe as well. And so I was in a conundrum because I said, oh my gosh, I love learning with Roger. I really do, but I didn't want to, to, I also wanted to learn from Alan. So how do I do this? So I asked Dale Lawness, who was the Dean at that time. And I said, I really want to learn from both. Is there a way? And Dale said, yes, if you're happy with Roger, stay with Roger for your private lessons. And at that time we had small ensembles, chamber ensembles. So Alan Harrington became uh, our small ensemble coach. So I had him as a coach, not necessarily as a private teacher, but he was our teacher for all the master classes and all that. So I feel I got the best of both worlds. I was the only one who decided to go that route. <laughs> so other people were kind of like, what are, you, what are you doing? That's so but, smart of you, Chantel. Yeah, I, I think it really, <clears throat> it was really a good choice because I got two perspectives and I, I was really thankful for that. Well, and as well, like you said, the, the way that Roger taught, right? As an educator, that you got so many tools learning from him in that way. Yes. And it was a big choice, you know, to decide if I wanted to play, like perform or, or to go into education because I didn't know. I really love to play. But I think I got a little scared <laughs> from seeing all the, the performance majors at the School of Music at the time, just seeing what they had to do, uh, maybe to be at that level, just being locked in their rooms and, and doing this. And, and for me, the pull was... I love to play, but I think I love people just as much. And for me to share what I love with people was, was the winner, I think. So 
Well, we're all very lucky that you decided to go that path. <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> so Chantel, I, am, I have no idea what you're going to share here, but of course I have to give the disclaimer that it is a family so, show, so, oh, yeah. uh, you know, watch, watch the contest. <laughs> so Chantel, <laughs> what is the weirdest gig or job that you've ever been involved in? Oh, man. Well, there are two. There are two experiences I want to share. I don't think they're as wild as some that I've heard, <laughs> but it was kind of cool, you know? So I just want to share it. I don't know if it's weird, but it's, it's really cool. So my first student teaching placement was with Rob Monson at Collège pierre Elliott Trudeau at that time. And uh, it was at the end of the year. And at the end of the year, one of his jazz bands performed at the High Neighbor Festival in Transcona. So he said to me, hey, Chantal, do you want to take it? Do you want to do it? I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I don't know if this was allowed, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he couldn't do it. I don't know what it was, but you know, I said, yeah, let's do it. So <clears throat> it was some sort of, you know, I guess on a weekend or whatever it was. And, uh, and so it was my first gig with, with, with this jazz band all by myself. So I had to make sure, you know, we had a meeting point and we, we met and, and, uh, and got to the place and saw the stage. And I don't know if you know anything about the festival at this time, but it always rains. Like there's always some rain. It's kind of like uh, going to the X, you know, there's always rain going on. And so I, I don't know if you knew this, that's where I first met Vanessa Nostowski. Really? Yes, she was in grade 11 in that band. Yes, she was. And here's another name who was in that band. Uh, I don't know if you might know her, Joanne. Her name is Michelle Lobos. She's an elementary music uh, teacher in St. Anne. Uh, she works in St. Anne's. And anyway, they were both in the band. So we all went to Vanessa's mom place for, for supper before, because, you know, <laughs> Vanessa's mom had it all organized. So that was really cool. And then we all went to the stage and we played. And sure enough, it started to rain. And I had no experience about playing in the rain, but I knew that if you had stuff plugged in, this was not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, the show must go on. The show, <laughs> the kids are playing and they're like, Madame, uh, you know, the bass amp's getting really wet here. <laughs> and I was like, just one more song, guys. One more song. <laughs> And there was no one in the audience. Like there was obviously the parents <laughs> with their rain gear. And they're like, yay! <laughs> and we played. So we played the whole gig, which was what, 20, 20 minutes. We, the poor kids were soaked and I was soaked. And I said, but we're just gonna finish. So that was a really cool thing. Uh, so again, not really weird, but kind of good. In hindsight, maybe I would have stopped it sooner, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> And so, and so that was a really nice turning point. I think I appreciated having the trust, right, to, to pull it off. So I kind of feel like it was a little notch in my belt. Okay, we did this. So I really like that. My second interesting uh, experience was I got a call in university from Professor Paul Patterson. He said, Chantel, we're having a musical. I said, what? U of M. We're putting on a musical. I said, we are? Yes. And it was to celebrate an anniversary of some sort. And they had dug up this musical that, that was written for the university back in the day. And he said, we need some musicians. And it was kind of last minute. And, and uh, I, I had some pretty good reading skills. So he said, you know, can you play tenor sax and come in and do this? And I said, okay. So here we were for a week playing in this pit band. And that was my first experience playing in a pit band. I had never done that before. And I was sitting next to Julie Husband, who was, of course, playing some saxophone, some flute, some bassoon, you know, just pulling it all guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, like, amazing. And Ross was there. Ross Ingstrup was there. So he was playing some saxophone, and I was playing some saxophone. We were next to the string players. And there was a keyboard there. And Paul Patterson was conducting. And... It was a really cool experience. I, I won't say it was weird. I wish I had, a, <laughs> but it was definitely fun. And Julie, by the way, taught at Golden Gate too. She was one of uh, the Golden Gate teachers, I think back in the 80s. So that was, 
kind of a little history there. How wonderful and, to be surrounded by all those people when you were that age. Yeah, like you just, yeah, it was a very big deal to, to be able to play with, with experienced people and, and it shapes you, right? You know, so I think, was it Chris Birdie in an interview that said, just say yes, you know, go for it. Just say yes. I'm so glad that I said yes, because I would have missed out on this really interesting opportunity. I think that's, that's wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. So Chantal, there are some kids that watch these, um, these interviews and do you have any advice for those who are thinking about going into music as a career? Oh yes. So here's my number one that I don't think has been said yet. Learn another language. Oh, learn another language. If you haven't had the opportunity become very good at it because it will be an asset to you. I think if, if not in your profession, in your life, if you travel, if you meet people, it might lead you to job opportunities, it might, but it will definitely help you get connected to a whole other uh, network of people that you may not have had the opportunity if you don't try, you know? I know so many of my colleagues who, who do know languages, whether it's officially or unofficially, or what, you know, what I mean by official is like whether they use it in their job or not, you know, and, and I think today's culture and, and young people in particular, I think many people I teach too, they know three, maybe four languages. So what I'm trying to say is get, get good at, at, at least another one of them besides English too. And, and, and maybe you can use it too. Cause I know for me having the French piece helped me professionally get, get a job, but also helped me just, understand a whole bunch of other things and have opportunities with people so that's number one number two i recommend you travel if you can and what i mean by that is not necessarily the whole world but if you know of a good you know if you're interested in becoming going into music know who you admire and see if you can find a way to go see them whether it be a concert or whether they're teachers and you just really think they have a good program, you know, get in there one afternoon and, you know, hey, hi, pr present yourself, introduce yourself, <laughs> and, say, and then say, hey, you know, I, I'm thinking of, of becoming a teacher here, or becoming, a, can I just observe some of your classes? I think that would be very good. I had one fellow do that. I, um, I didn't want to say, well, I don't know if they'd be okay with it. I'm sure they would, but anyway. I had that experience at Golden Gate. I got a call and this young man who was deciding whether he wanted to go into music or not gave me a call and said, I heard Golden Gate has a great program. Can I just come in and watch? And I said, yeah, like, come on in. So, 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 they, so he watched and got some experience. So I think that that would really help, help them a lot. Another thing, uh, musically, but also character-wise, know your strengths, right? Know what you're really good at and kind of use that uh, to get to places and opportunities. And also know your weaknesses. So what I mean by that is that could be on your instrument, you know, things that, that you know, yeah, I, I can do this really well. Or things that, that you need to work on. But also character-wise, and that's probably the hardest thing to do. We are who we are, but that doesn't mean that we can't, we don't always have something to work on. All of us, all of us. So me too, everyone. So um, I think if you're a young person and you can recognize your strengths and your weaknesses, always keep that in the back of your mind and, and keep working at it because I think that will help you grow and change and meet and, and, and get new opportunities. Yeah. Here's my last one. And uh, I have this memory in, in, uh, in education. Connie Turner was teaching us uh, a, uh, an education class. Man, I was so glad. She, she was great. And she had invited her good friend, Marlene Stephen, to come in. Yes. 
and and the and she invited many people too but this particular time Marlene and Connie were holding mock interviews and they were looking for three volunteers oh so what how incredible good for you yes. I said I'm gonna I want to interview right and so how it worked is we all left the room like we had time to prepare obviously this wasn't just in one session okay so we all left the room and all three of us would interview and Connie and, and Marlene would ask the questions and the rest of the people who who didn't whatever wanted got to observe and hear the exact same questions and three different versions of answers so that's like really cool for them too it was a learning experience for everybody how terrifying I, uh, yes <laughs> so you had to like prepare your your resume and you know have everything ready and, and like come in like and dress up and it was really cool and I think I did it I forget if Brent had done it he was in that class with me too anyway I just kind of but anyway so so I didn't get to hear the other people who interviewed but after that we had a round table and talked about it and Connie and Marlene said there are two things you really really need to do this job because this was music education they said you've got to love kids and you've got to love music and as long and you've got to say that too <laughs> in your interviews so i thought i'd share that bit because that always stuck with me of course now i believe like i believe it it's i'm not just right. saying to say it obviously you have to believe it but i think as everybody my colleagues have said in the videos you've got to love what you do and love to share it and for me it's it's young people but if it you know adults too everybody you've got to love what you do and love the people you're sharing it with that stuck with me and i remember their words so hopefully i can They're share very that. wise words indeed but i'll tell you if i was interviewed even now in that situation by those ladies i would be sweating <laughs> Well, I was, I was, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to say? <laughs> and you think you know something, you know, like in those days you think, oh yeah, I know something. <laughs> and then oh. you do it for a long time and then you're like, yeah, maybe I don't know everything and that's okay. That's what, you know. <laughs> well, I'm going to be interviewing Connie this summer, so I'll have to bring that up with her. <laughs> yes, yes, please do. That's, that's so, really good. Chantal, my final question. These okay. are strange times indeed that we are in right now. Do you have any worldly bits of wisdom that you'd like to leave our viewers with? Yes, I do. Don't be scared of what people think. Don't be scared. Well, I'm not going to say this because, you know, oh, people are just going to think I, this about me. You know, th this is baloney. Stop that little voice in your head and learn to speak your mind and provide rationale <laughs> provide the rationale behind what you want to say and that's will help you earn people's respect i think that that's a really important thing i'm not just saying spew off any idea you have in your head but if but don't be scared because you might have the best idea but the only person if you don't share it shutting it down is yourself and who are you to judge what everybody else is going to think? You don't know. So, so I think that that's a lesson I, I am, have learned and I'm learning a little bit more to, to do. And in these times in particular, enjoy your family, obviously, and, and people who you look up to. Try to always aspire, right? Like try to hang out with people or, or that, that give you, that feed you, right? That feed your soul, that, that give you energy, that energize you, that, that maybe have a skill that you're thinking, oh, I want to do that too. So always, always move forward, you know? It's good to recollect, don't get me wrong, but always have that little plan. And maybe use this time, now that the world has slowed down a little, to reflect, right? Because we always say we will, or we'll always get to that thing, and I don't know if we, if we do. So if you do have time to make a plan, Make a plan, and then for God's sake, set a timeline. <laughs> because 
No, no, but for something you really want to achieve, okay? Some, some you'll never, you know, it's, it just goes on forever. But I think setting an actual timeline and saying, okay, I want to get better at this skill or, you know, at this time, by the end of the month of May, where am I at? Is a good check-in. You need you need to to check in whether you're there or not. You know, you can decide whether that's what you need to do. But that'll help you reassess. So, those are my worldly bits of <laughs> knowledge <laughs> that hopefully help a few people. They've helped me. Absolutely, Chantal. It is always so wonderful to talk to you. Uh, you bring me such joy. I love your laughter and your your honesty and integrity and your authenticity. Um, I really hope that once this all, we can start to hang out together, that we get a lot more time together because you you fuel my happiness. Um, you're one of those people that just, uh, when after we talk, I, I always come away thinking, man, I need to spend more time with you. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom and your stories today. It has indeed been a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope that you have an amazing rest of your, of your day and your long weekend. Right, right. Well, thanks, Joanne. It's, uh, thanks for the kind words. Right back at you. It's, it's, it's awesome. I love these videos. Watch <laughs> the videos. <They're> <laughs> thanks, Chantel. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.